morning and welcome to Water's Edge. Uh, maybe you're sitting in our auditorium, maybe you're online, but we're glad that you're visiting with us this morning or uh, returning maybe after a time away or maybe you're coming every single week and we're just happy to see your face once again. We've got an awesome service today. Kel was telling me about um, the message this week. We're continuing on in, in the series called Dirt and boy oh boy is this going to be good. Uh, we're going to be discussing a little bit, too, about one of the authors that I really enjoy to read. So I sure hope that you get a lot out of this service and um, that we can open up just celebrating a, a week, a week of, I know it's been wonderful weather, and I, I pray that that sunshine has been shining in your lives as well. So we're going to op open up singing. This is a new song that we did at Music in the Parking Lot, and I just want to introduce it to you. It's called World Outside Your Window. There's a song that stirs the spirit and it calls the heart to life. It's an anthem in the making. Can you feel it start to rise? Can you hear the generations getting louder over time? Every son and every daughter singing out into the night. It's not time to be silent. Don't you dare hide your light. There's a world outside your window, so don't let it pass by. Lift your hands to the heavens. Lift your voice to the sky. Praise the Lord of all creation. Let his name be lifted high. Singing, oh. In the blink of an eye, death and all our sin, nowhere in sight. For the Lord, he is alive. See the lost return from the dead of the night. Every captive freed, every chain left behind. Have you ever seen such a beautiful sight? All the world coming alive. See the last part of one heart at a time. See the strongholds break in the blink of an eye. Death and all our sins don't wear in sight for the Lord. He is alive. See the Lord. 
lost, return from the dead of the night, every captive freed, every chain left behind, have you ever seen such a beautiful sight, all the world coming alive, oh, 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 it's not time to silence, don't you dare hide your light, there's a world outside your window, so don't let it
Hey everybody, I'm so glad that you're tuning in this week for our final, ser- or final sermon in the series called Dirt. Now, in this series, we've been looking at times in the Bible when God has used dirt to do extraordinary things. And so, uh, and I just want to say next week, uh, we're starting a brand new series. I, I don't know quite what I'm going to call it yet, but it's going to be about politics. I figured as we run up to the election, it's a perfect time for us to talk about politics in church. And so uh, be looking ahead for that. Uh, but today I wanted to start off by uh, reading for a passage from the Gospel of John. And so uh, it, it, it starts off like this. It says, at dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. They're talking about Jesus. Jesus sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him, for accusing Jesus. They were trying to get rid of Jesus. And it says, But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. 
Now, in December of 2013, there was a young woman, uh, she, well, she's still named this, but her name was Justine Sacco. And in December of 2013, Justine boarded a plane from New York to South Africa. And, and for those of you that don't know, that is a very long flight. It's one of the longest flights in the world. When I traveled to Lesotho, we flew out of America to uh, South Africa. It was a 17-hour flight. Longest flight I've ever been on, probably the longest flight I'll ever be on. Uh, I watched a lot of movies. But just before she got on the plane, Justine Sacco, she tweeted a really bad joke on Twitter. Really bad. At the time, she had about 171 followers on Twitter, mostly people she knew, mostly people, you know, that knew her sense of humor. And, and, and these followers, they were used to the off-color comments because people that follow her knew that she regularly made fun of the, of, of the bad situations that were kind of in our American bubble. And so, but... Sacco, on this day, she tweeted something, and it struck a nerve. So this is what Sacco's tr- tweet said. It said, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. Now, let me be clear. That is an awful tweet, you, it, 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 and, it's, and it's horrible, and, and it's just an awful thing to say, especially when you don't have any context. And, and, and Justine Sacco, uh, later on, she would describe how she was kind of speaking about getting out of her American bubble, and she was being very satirical here. But she, she, even she says, this was a really dumb thing to say. And, but what happened was, While Justine was in the air, so she's in the air for probably somewhere between 12 and 17 hours, but while she was in the air, her tweet went viral. And it didn't just go a little viral. It went very viral. All of a sudden, Justine Sacco was the number one trending uh, everything on Twitter, not just in America, but worldwide. And everyone hated her, hated her so bad for what she had said. There was someone in South Africa that actually went to the airport because what happened was while Justine was in the air, basically everything was blowing up on Twitter. Uh, People found out where she worked. People found out who her family were. And all of these people started making phone calls. All these people started, you know, like getting into her life and basically dismantling her life. By the time that Justine landed in South Africa, Africa. She didn't know it because at that time you didn't get Wi-Fi on airplanes, but in between her her trip from New York to South Africa, she she had been fired from her job. Uh, She had basically been banned from almost all social media. She had, you know, made news worldwide. So much so that people in South Africa, they went to the airport to videotape her coming off the plane because they knew once she got off the plane that her phone would start blowing up and they wanted to see her reaction. And that's just what happened. Justine's life was destroyed. And and there was so much shame that was piled upon her. You know, like I said, she was fired. Uh, All all of a sudden, she was a single woman. She wouldn't be able to date probably for years because everyone knew her name. Everyone knew what she had done. And so her life was completely upended. It took years for her to fight back to get to some semblance of of normal. And even now, I was reading some articles that are after the fact, she does not get in the news. Like there's people that will call her and ask for a story and she'll say, nope, I've learned my lesson. I do not bring attention to myself in any public forums. Now, what she said was awful, but I want you to take just a moment Because I'm sure there's been a time that you've messed up. I'm sure there's been a time that you've said something that you regretted. And and luckily for you, it probably wasn't on a worldwide stage. But so if you could try to just take a moment and imagine what Justine Sacco felt like as her world came crumbling down around her. Did she make a mistake? Yes, big one. She said something that she should have never said. 
But what happened to Justine is something that happens often in our culture. Nowadays, we have a term for it. We call it cancel culture. And, and if someone steps out of line or something, someone does something that, that, that the crowd does not like, so often, all of a sudden, we try to get them banned from them having any semblance of life at all. But what it boils down to, and what Justine felt is a word that I want to talk about extensively today. And that word is shame. Now, I don't know if you've heard of her, but Brene Brown is a researcher from Texas. She's an author, and she's one of the most highly viewed TED Talkers in history. And she has studied shame and vulnerability as a career. And this is how she defines shame. She says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Brown goes on to describe how in our culture we are experiencing an epidemic of shame. How shame is prevalent in the everyday and how shame is different for men and women. She speaks so powerfully to this. And so what I want to do right now is I'm going to pause and I'm going to show you about a three and a half minute clip of Brene Brown, Brene Brown speaking uh, about shame and vulnerability. And so because there's just a reality here, I can't do it better than her. But now, I want you to know, as, as we go forward here, towards the end of her clip, she does use a four-letter word. I have, I have taken it out, but you can still tell what she was saying because it was very quick. Uh, so uh, just so you know that's there, that's not something we usually have in church. But, you know, I took it out, uh, but you will be able to clearly understand what she meant. And so don't focus on that. Focus on what she's saying. So... Here's Brene Brown. The thing to understand about shame is it's not guilt. Shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. How many of you, if you did something that was hurtful to me, would be willing to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake? How many of you would be willing to say that? Guilt. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Shame. I'm sorry, I am a mistake. There is a huge difference between shame and guilt. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. And here's what you even need to know more. Guilt, inversely correlated with those things. The ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable but it's adaptive. The other thing you need to know about shame is it's absolutely organized by gender. If shame washes over me and washes over Chris, it's gonna feel the same. Everyone sitting in here knows the warm wash of shame. We're pretty sure that the only people who don't experience shame are people who have no capacity for connection or empathy. Which means, yes, I have a little shame. No, I'm a sociopath. So I would opt for, yes, you have a little shame. <laughs> shame feels the same for men and women, but it's organized by gender. For women, the best example I can give you is Anjali, the commercial. I can put the wash on the line, pack the lunches, hand out the kisses, and be work at five to nine. I can bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan, and never let you forget you're a man. For women, shame is do it all, do it perfectly, and never let them see you sweat. I don't know how much perfume that commercial sold, but I guarantee you it moved a lot of antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds. <laughs> shame for women is this web of unattainable, conflicting, competing expectations about who we're supposed to be. And it's a straitjacket. For men, shame is not a bunch of competing, conflicting expectations. Shame is one. Do not be perceived as what? Weak. I did not interview men for the first four years of my study. And it wasn't until a man looked at me one day after a book signing and said, I love what you have to say about shame. I'm curious why you didn't mention men. And I said, I don't study men. 
And he said, that's convenient. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, because you say to reach out, tell our story, be vulnerable. But you see those books you just signed for my wife and my three daughters? I said, yeah. They'd rather me die on top of my white horse than watch me fall down. When we reach out and be vulnerable, we get the shit beat out of us. And don't tell me it's from our, the guys and the coaches and the dads. Because the women in my life are harder on me than anyone else. Now, I wanted to show you this clip because let's be real, there's just some things that I can't say as a pastor. And there's just some things, especially to women, that I can't speak to. The way that Brene talks about the, 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 the shame that women experience, I don't have an experience in that. Just like most women don't, have, don't know the experience that men deal with when it comes to their shame. And so, but I wanted you to see this because Brene Brown is an incredible resource. I, I, if you want to know more about shame and vulnerability outside of the sermon, look her up. She's got books. She's got TED Talks. They're all valuable. They're all great. And so go there. Today though, I wanted to share with you the format of this sermon series. And as I do this, you're going to kind of see the direction that, that we're going. And so we're in this sermon series called Dirt. And in week one of the series, we looked at Genesis 2 and the creation of the world. We saw how God formed humanity out of the dirt. And so we came to this conclusion that God is with us before the beginning of our lives. So God formed us out of the dirt, so God is with us in the beginning. And then the next week, in week two, we talked about how God had buried Moses in the dirt. And, and, and through that, we learned how God is with us at the end of our lives. And so God is with us at the beginning, and God is with us in the end. But there are so many people out there that are like, where is God now? Where is God in this moment. And, and so last week we saw how Jesus used the dirt to heal a man born blind. And so we learned that God is with us in our brokenness. And now this week we're talking about shame. And so I bet you can fill in this blank all by yourself. Week four, God is with us in our, that's right, in our shame. Now, the reason I told the story of Justine Sacco and the reason why I showed you the clip of Brene Brown is that I want you to understand that shame is not just something that some of us deal with. Shame is something that we all deal with. In our culture and in our time, we are starting to, as a culture, be people who pile shame upon others. And this isn't something that's new, but it's something I think that we're getting better at. And it's becoming more and more public online. And so today we read a passage of scripture that deals with this very situation. In our passage today from John, we see that there's this woman that's been caught in the act of adultery. And, and in other words, she was sleeping with a man who was not her husband. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they found her right there. And they rip her from that situation and they bring her before Jesus. In reality, the Pharisees don't really care about the woman at all. They want to trap Jesus. They have ulterior motives. But what they're willing to do is to put this woman's shame in front of everybody in order to get what they want. If they really cared for her, then she wouldn't be there. They could have posed to Jesus a hypothetical situation. If they really cared about the law, then the man who she was being adulterous with would also be there because he was also breaking the law. But instead, it's just the woman. And, and, and it, and it kind of went like this. So the Pharisees, they come to Jesus and say, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And, and, and then the Bible says they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing Jesus. Jesus. 
the accusation would have gone something like this. These Pharisees, they, they were trying to trap Jesus. So, you know, they wanted to be rid of him. They wanted to get rid of Jesus. They saw Jesus as dangerous and, and, and dangerous to their way of life. And so they bring to Jesus this dilemma. And, and they say, all right, Jesus, what side of this are you on? Are you on the side of Moses or are you on the side of grace? And so they they bring to Jesus this dilemma. And if Jesus were to say that they shouldn't stone her, then they, the the Pharisees could then write him off because he would be going against the law of Moses. And that was central to what they believed. But instead, if he said that they should uphold the law and that they should stone the woman, then the Pharisees could go to the Romans with all of these witnesses and say, oh, Jesus is condemning people. Jesus said that we should go and and, and practice, you know, capital punishment, which was under Roman law, something that only the Romans could do. And so Jesus would have been arrested and tried as a criminal if he would have said that. So they thought they were bringing Jesus into a lose-lose situation. So they bring this woman up, brought her up in her shame in front of everyone for all to see. The Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. But my, my, my question, my thought is this, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do in this moment when, when the Pharisees bring this woman to Jesus? And, and, and I want you to see what Jesus did. It says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, we've been talking about how God, you know, something special happens when God uses dirt. And so at this point, you know, we know ground and dirt are the same thing. And so uh, Jesus begins his response about this woman's shame by drawing in the dirt. Now, this leads to the question, what is Jesus drawing? And, and, and it's hard to know for certain what he was, what, what he was drawing. Um, but Historians believe that Jesus was drawing certain, some historians, they believe that Jesus was drawing cer- certain scriptures. And what he was doing is he was, he was outlining in the law other passages where, where, people are, are, where, where, the, where God's people are called to grace, where God's people are called to compassion. And so it'd be like he was calling out the people that had brought this woman to him. Uh, some other people believe that Jesus went down in the dirt because as the Pharisees brought this woman right from this adulterous relationship, that she was naked. And, and, and so Jesus kind of diverted his eyes so he wouldn't be looking at her nakedness. This doesn't really make as much sense to me because after everybody leaves, Jesus, Jesus looks her in the eye and tells her, no, don't sin anymore. And so... My favorite interpretation uh, of what Jesus was doing when he wrote in the dirt was that he started listing the sins of all the people that were there. And I imagine he started with the most important lawgivers first. Uh, Some people believe that he was even like writing down the names of women that these men had had adulterous relationships with. And so, and I just, I love this idea of Jesus Riding in the dirt, the sins that no one else would know that these men had committed. And yet here they are trying to condemn this woman. The hypocrisy would have just been thick in the air. And so, it, 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 and, but the, you know, no matter what he did, no matter what he wrote in the ground, his response is brilliant. Because the Pharisees, they've come. They've come with a mob. They've come with a crowd. They've come to cause a stir. And and they're in the heat of the moment. And and there's this woman, and she was caught in adultery. And so, like, they're holding on to stones. They are ready to enact the law at Jesus' word. They are there. And so they're, they're causing all of this emotion. And what does Jesus do? Jesus takes all of that emotion, and he basically just smashes it. Because they expected him to get all flustered. They expected him to make a brash decision. And instead, what he does is he bends down and he starts drawing in the dirt. But they demand an answer. They keep pestering him. It goes on to say, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who was without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And then look what it said again. And again, he stooped down and wrote in the dirt. I imagine, you just imagine he looked in someone's eyes and said, you be the first to 
throw the stone. And then he goes down and he writes someone's name or he writes a certain sin. At this, the crowd got it. Jesus was upholding the law, but Jesus was also challenging the the Pharisees on their own understanding of compassion and grace. They all knew that they were sinners. They all knew that they had messed up before. They all knew that none of them could stand up to the righteousness of God. And I think that's why the older men left first. Because I, I remember when I was younger and I kind of thought I knew everything. Have you ever been in that part of your life where you think you knew everything? Uh, and, and I thought that I was a better person than I probably was. Now that I'm getting older, I'm quicker to realize that I mess up all the time. I think it was that way with the Pharisees. I think the older guys were like, yep, yep, he's got us. All right, let's go. And, and so, and then all, all of a sudden, all the, the, the younger men started to follow. So they all leave. And Jesus is left with the woman, possibly still naked, definitely still feeling her shame. What does Jesus say to her? Jesus straightens up and asks her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Listen to these words from Jesus. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus shows in this moment the grace of God. Jesus in this moment shows compassion that others just don't seem to have. But Jesus doesn't just give her a free pass. He also challenges her to go and to leave her life of sin. It's so good. It's so good what Jesus does. And this is what God does. God is all about compassion and forgiveness. So many people believe that they are unworthy of God. So many people let their shame get in the way of having a relationship with God. But Jesus doesn't just avoid the woman because of her shame. Jesus instead is with the woman. He was arguably in a more dangerous position than she was. The the Pharisees were after him, not her. And yet he stays with her. And then when all the crowds leave, he could have just left her there in her shame. He could have just left her to go back home to try to pick up the pieces of her life. And instead, he addresses her. He speaks right into her eyes. And he addresses her shame directly. Because I know what she was feeling. And I imagine you know what she was feeling because we've all felt shame before. We know that she was feeling shame. We know that she was feeling that she was worthy of condemnation. She was worthy of of everything that they were saying because she had messed up. She had made a mistake. She had done something that she wasn't supposed to do. And so, Jesus looks at her and he speaks those words, I don't condemn you. And those are the only words that could release her from her shame. So, let me just challenge you a little bit now. We started this sermon with a story about Justine Sacco. And I said that I did not condone what she said at all. And I still don't. What she said, horrible. In fact, if I would have been on Twitter at that time and I would have seen that, I would have probably been one of the very many people to pile on and to shame her for what she said. Um, But... What I know now after reading this passage about Jesus and the woman caught in adultery is that God expects better of us. God wants better for us. Do I believe that God wants us to call out injustice? Absolutely, 100%. But do I think that God wants us to use shame to hurt people? I don't think so. I wonder how many of us are using shame to hold something over someone else, to hold some sort of power over someone else in our lives. I wonder how many people out there that are listening to this today 
are holding on to shame ourselves. There's something that is inside of us that, that we are ashamed of, that there's this shame that is inside of us that, that we are having trouble letting go of. One of the things that Brene Brown says in her talk is that 99% of the time, our biggest critic that is heaping the shame on us is ourselves. But we believe in Jesus. We are children of God, and as we have seen, God is with us in our shame. More than that, Jesus refused to condemn the woman in her shame. And so let me just encourage you, if you are dealing in shame, maybe it's time for you to learn how to deal in grace. Maybe it's time for you to stop holding that shame over other people. If you are dealing with shame, if you have shame inside of yourself, you should know that God does not condemn you, that God loves you, that God's grace is for you. And rather than condemning you, God sent his son Jesus to save you. And just like Jesus in that moment with the woman that was caught in adultery, just like Jesus did not condemn her, Jesus died for you and for me. Someone out there needs to hear today that all of your pain, that all of this shame, that in the eyes of God, it's not being held against you, that you are worthy, that you are more than that. You are loved. You see, when we feel shame, we feel disconnected. But you don't have to feel that way anymore because God is here to save you. God is here to show you love. Christ died to take away our sin. Christ died to take away our shame. Christ has died so that you might have life. And that is why we come to church on Sundays and we praise God. And that is why we praise Jesus and the Holy Spirit for the amazing things that they have done. Amen. 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 Would you pray with me? God, there are so many of us that are fighting shame in our culture. There are so many of us that are fighting shame in our own lives. And so God, right now, I pray that your Holy Spirit, that your presence would be with those people that are that are, that are feeling shame, that, that God, just like the woman that was caught in adultery, that, that Jesus' words would speak into their hearts and into their lives and that they would not feel shame anymore. God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you sought us out. You brought a way for us to come back to you. God, thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, three questions for us to take home and to think about. Uh, Question number one, think about a time that when you felt shame, how did you get through that time or get over your shame? Question number two, Brene Brown said that shame uh, hits hits us all, but it is organized differently by gender. Why do you think that is? And what do you think the differences are? between how the genders deal with shame. And then question number three, Jesus told the woman caught in adultery that he did not condemn her. What do you think that those words meant for her? And what did they signify? All right, that's all for me. Let's finish up our worship service today, and I'll see you next week for our brand new series dealing about politics. You are above every other Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy in. When death was arrested and my life passed, ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. Death was arrested in my life
chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he paid for the door. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. tuning in with us. Um, I just hope you have a great week. If there's anything that you need, uh, be sure to call the church. We're getting phone calls right to our phones if we're not here in the office. Um, check out the Kids Ministry Facebook page. There'll be curriculum posted throughout the week there. Uh, we just want to be able to help you as best we can and see you here again next week. Take care. <laughs>